Let's go ahead and get started. I, I've got a bunch of slides here. I'm going to try to uh, move through them, but I, I don't know that we're going to get through them all. Uh, this is the first time I've done uh, this sort of presentation uh, with respect to the UC Santa Cruz. Um, that this is a new sort of thing that's happened over the summer is that UC Social Storage is now an um, incubator inside the uh, University of uh, California at Santa Cruz. And uh, specifically, um, it's inside an organization called CROSS, which is a, the Center for Research on Open Source Software. Um, this is an organization that was uh, essentially founded by Sage, Whale, uh, Sage Weil. Uh, Sage is the author of Ceph. Uh, he did his PhD thesis at Santa Cruz on Ceph and consistent hashing and all these great things that we see in scale out. Um, and he took Ceph as a graduate research project. He turned it into an open source project. Uh, eventually incubated it in a startup and then eventually got it sold to Red Hat. Um, and he wanted to see that success replicated again and again uh, through the university system. So he's actually found, uh, is the founder uh, of uh, Cross, and the idea is to replicate that. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, research that's going on, uh, education, we have projects that are part of the uh, research work, um, and eventually those, those projects turn into incubations that uh, hopefully uh, create successful open source projects. Uh, from there, it's up to the, the students and the people involved to take it beyond that. But it currently is um, funded uh, by industry. Uh, we have an industry advisory board uh, uh, that essentially pays annual dues and essentially funds all the research and the incubation uh, for open source. And there is a number of projects inside this organization today. Uh, definitely has an open source uh, focus. Everything we do is open source. So all the things that we're talking about today in new social storage will all be open source based. Um, and currently we have, uh, I forget the number, we have uh, Toshiba, Micron, uh, Samsung, Seagate, Western Digital, Huawei are all members that are funding uh, this organization right now. And I didn't introduce myself. Uh, I am Philip Kufelt. Uh, I've been in the storage industry for about 25 years, uh, working, starting at Veritas and working through a number of storage companies, uh, uh, some my own and some you know, big companies. Uh, my last gig, uh, my last two gigs were uh, at uh, Toshiba and Huawei. At Huawei, I was a director of storage standards, and at Toshiba, uh, I created the KV Drive, which is kind of an example of uh, what we're going to be talking about today, which is a uh, autonomous storage device. Uh, but as I was working with both of these companies, I had an opportunity to work with Cross as well, and I saw that Cross was this neat intersection between industry and research, and my feeling is that moving forward with offloaded intelligent storage devices is something that's going to take time. The industry is not going to tomorrow say, yes, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have to stage it in a strategic fashion over a number of years that is going to be combined with research to prove out the proof points of why it's a good idea. So we need the research. We need the industry to provide comments and commentary to guide and mold it in the direction that it needs to go in. So I thought Cross was a great place to place it. So this summer, uh, I took you social storage and put it in, in Cross, and actually am now uh, a member of the staff at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, so you social storage, uh, we uh, at Cross, we had our first presentation at Fast 18. Um, we published an article in Usenix login. If you want to go there, the, everything I'm talking about today is in that article. Uh, I'm kind of redoing that article as part of this presentation. Uh, and then if you want to see information about Cross, and also we have a symposium that's coming up in the beginning of October uh, that is a very interesting uh, showing of all the work that's going on, not only in Cross, but also bringing in uh, industry and other research organizations to talk about uh, interesting storage topics. There will be a use social storage topic there, and we're going to focus on the strategic goal of use social storage, which is in storage compute. And we're going to talk about the trade offs between the different types of models of uh, storage compute, in storage compute. 
So I encourage you to come out and take a look at it. OK, so half of this presentation is going to be some of the motivations of why we think offloading is the right direction. Um, the industry right now is going in two different directions. Um, we have uh, a lot of people looking at sort of the uh, moving intelligence off of the storage devices and into the host and allowing the host to do closer management of the underlying uh, media itself. So you see that with like open channel and uh, uh, some of the things going on in the industry. At the same time, we're also looking at composability and disaggregation. And those are going to be moving the, data, moving the data farther away, which means doing data management across to the fabric is going to get more expensive. So uh, we're going to look at the offloading argument and talk about why we think it's a good, good direction to go in. And then we're going to talk about the sort of framework, the strategic framework of what eSocial storage is. So first of all, I've been using the term eSocial for those who don't know what that means. Uh, you know, it's essentially eSocial is a social strategy that's used by insects and organisms where you have highly, specif uh, highly specialized groups of individuals that provide uh, individual tasks and they're focused and that's what they do and so you can think of this like ants or termites those kind of things so we thought it was a good metaphor for you social storage can we devise a system where you have these autonomous intelligent uh, devices that are doing something specific uh, for the media that they are because every media is not created equal um, and uh, and then but collapse uh, combines together to make a unified whole that provides an amazing amount of uh, uh, services. And you'll hear me start using the term casts. This is a term that we've decided to adopt from, uh, uh, from the eusocial uh, uh, aspect in animals. This is a grouping of, uh, of like-minded uh, organisms. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So why eusocial storage? I, I'm going to talk in depth about three different trends, public and private cloud. I'm going to talk about server offload specifically and disaggregation. And then uh, talking about how the, the ways of the past may not, may not fit into the future. All right. So public cloud. This is uh, an area I don't hear a lot of people talking about, but uh, as far as an, a reason for going in a particular technological direction. Um, right now, we have a lot of public cloud uh, storage offerings that are out there. There's a handful of big guys out there providing cloud, and we are talk, always talk about how we're migrating our data and resources into these public clouds. Um, and yet, if you look at some of the marketing statistics that are out there, um, even as of late, uh, there was some 451 research that shows that the migration isn't necessarily all one direction. We are not always taking our stuff and moving it into the public cloud. We're actually doing both. We're migrating back to the private clouds as well, and there's a various reasons for that, you know, uh, for from security to control to cost. There's a bunch of reasons why uh, private clouds still make sense uh, today. It's still a management problem, uh, but it still exists. And I think the big data centers took notice of that, and you can see that because, uh, for example, uh, a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago you now can buy Azure Stack, which is a private cloud version of the Azure Stack, right? So I can now deploy Azure Stack in my, in my on-prem or uh, off-prem private air area, and then also be utilizing uh, public cloud uh, services as well, and it provides for an easy migration. So that's the strategy from the big cloud guys, is that let's, you know, public or private, let's lock them into what we're doing, and it makes it easier to migrate back and forth. Um, Google partnered with Nutanix about 18 months ago. There's even rumors now that maybe they're coming up with their own uh, private cloud offering outside of Nutanix. But it just shows that the industry has taken note that there's, there's not just one market. It's not just public cloud and everybody's moving there. There is private cloud as well. And I think, uh, you know, from my standpoint, one of the worst possible outcomes is that we end up uh, five or ten years from now with five big cloud companies, and we all do our business with those five cloud companies. It's bad for the industry. It's bad for vendors. Vendors don't have the ability to get R&D to move the market forward uh, because they're all uh, essentially servicing these five big customers instead of a wide uh, width of customer base. Um, and uh, 
But what's missing in the private cloud world, I think, is still a easy to use, easy to deploy, um, scalable, uh, scale out system that allows you to uh, deploy this in the private cloud without a lot of expense, right? Some of the reasons why we look to public cloud um, is the management, the complexity, all of those things are some of the reasons why we, we move to public cloud. So I think this is what, one of the things that's still missing today, is, is a good, easy to use. There's lots of stuff out there, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, as far as easy to use and provides all the feature set that you get from a public cloud is another story completely. Server offload. Um, this was a, a talk given uh, by Fritz Kruger and Sa Annual Sa Ali Alan Samuels of Western Digital uh, about two years back, and I think it's still relevant today. They were talking about how uh, uh, CPU bandwidth, um, it's actually not CPU bandwidth, it's more the RAM bandwidth is becoming the, the bottleneck of, of tomorrow. Um, we can easily, let me back up, the, the bandwidth of NAND, for example, is skyrocketing right now, and that's what this chart is showing. They, they basically went historically and looked at uh, storage bandwidth over time, and then uh, uh, looked at network bandwidth over time, and also looked at uh, DDR bandwidth over time. And the, the rate in which the network and the um, uh, storage uh, bandwidth is increasing right now is far outstripping the DDR bandwidth at this point. It's not uh, yet above it, that's why I can still put five, 10 SSDs uh, per proc to a system. But as these things get continually faster and faster, the number of SSDs that I could attach to a per processor basis is gonna get smaller and smaller. And when I say that, I mean that you're not hiding bandwidth, right? I can add 30 SSDs to a system, but I'm not gonna be able to attain all of the bandwidth that those SSDs provide because they're gonna be behind that bottleneck of the DRAM because I can't get the data in and out quick enough, okay? So uh, that means that uh, essentially um, the DMAs right now are doing two different things. Whenever you're talking about uh, I.O., you're talking about two different kinds of I.O. There's the I.O. that clients are really trying to do, right? I'm trying to do read and write my data. Um, but then there's usually management of that data that's going on underneath the covers, right? Behind the file system, behind the volume management, behind the scale out uh, for replication, all of these things is data management that's going on, which means I'm gonna be bringing data in and out of the server, consuming that DMA bandwidth, uh, even though it's not for my primary client application point uh, for use by the application. I'm gonna get into a little deeper that, that uh, uh, picture in just a second. Um, furthermore, uh, just to show you, uh, this was a, a talk given by Jay Doe of Microsoft. He's a, in the Microsoft Research Organization, and he, taught, and he basically provided a nice graphic showing that server mismatch. The, the fact that I can layer up uh, flash dies uh, behind a flash controller attached to PCIe that is then attached to the root complex that then has to talk to this CPU, and I can easily stack up enough dies to give myself easily a, a 66x sort of ratio between available bandwidth and the NAND dies compared to what I can do at the CPU and in the memory. And again, this is, the real work is north and south. It's moving data in and out. You're gonna hear me talk about north and south, east and west a lot today. North and south is moving the data in and out for the client application. Uh, but then there are data management and there's a north-south component to that for doing translations, compaction, deduplication, all of those kind of things, um, as well as east and west traffic. And that's where I'm gonna be doing redundancy, recovering, rebalancing, tiering, caching. All of those things are moving data from one device to the next. So those are east and west type of transactions. So let's look at an example of the north and south. So here, in this picture, I've got a, uh, essentially a server that's running RocksDB. I'm, I'm doing a key value store. So uh, that means my clients above the server want to get key value services and they want to be able to put and get values. Uh, unfortunately, they, for RocksDB to be implemented successfully, it goes through a number of translation layers. For example, it uses a file system to place its SST files. 
Um, that means I have to translate uh, between a key value to what SST file does it live in. So that's one of the, value, the jobs of the key value store. But then when I get into the file system, the file system has to translate between that file and an LBA. And then the block layer passes it down to the LBA, and then the LBA gets translated again to a physical address by the FTL. So there's lots of translations that are going on in this stack. But in addition to that, so there's extra I.O. for metadata and things of that nature that are going on as part of that uh, data path. But in addition to that, because of uh, the characteristics of a, of a key value store and you keep it in a sorted order, there's garbage collection, there's sorting that has to go on, and that causes files to be read in and read out uh, back and forth uh, in addition to the key value operations that the client is providing. So for example, when I, uh, for example, RocksDB is a level DB type of implementation, which means that I have different levels in which my data is uh, stored in, and that gives me a way of uh, efficiently sorting data as it comes into the system and not resorting data that I don't need to. Um, and as data fills up a layer, then I have to move it up to another layer, which causes garbage collection and other things of that nature. That's when you start to see this reading in of data and writing out of data back and forth, not for the actual uh, client, but to do the data management of the key value store. But it also does things like scrubbing. Is my data correct? Periodically, it's going out and looking at the data to see if it checks some matches. Reading in the data, writing that data back out. So that's consuming this DMA bandwidth, which we've already talked about as a bottleneck. I'm consuming it for not work for the client. I'm consuming it for work for the storage, for storage man and data management. Scale out situation gets a little worse because you've got to do the same things in scale out, but now I'm doing it not only north and south, moving data between the device and the host, but I'm also moving data between the host and other hosts and other media. So I not only move data in and out north and south, but now east and west. I move data from clients to media uh, to other scale out servers for redundancy. Um, I also do it for recovery when I'm recovering erasure coded uh, data and things of that nature. Uh, when it's time to rebalance, when you add a new system with a bunch of storage in it into a scale-out environment, you want to then redistribute the data across to all the available disks so that you're taking advantage of the capacity and access. Um, so you have rebalancing that goes on. Um, and then typically a lot of the uh, uh, scale-out systems are providing a single quality of service. In other words, I have a scale-out for my disks, I have a scale-out for my SSD, I have different scale outs for different purposes. And then I have to migrate data when it's time to migrate it for information lifecycle management type of things, right? I put it on the SSD scale out to start with because that's when everybody's hitting it and it needs to be fast, but over time I'm gonna age it and put it over somewhere else. Again, consuming that bandwidth of the DMA to get it into the host and then back out to some other server and to some other scale out. So, Scale out is a strong candidate uh, for offloading, as are the key value stores. And just, here's just a picture of what I was talking about, about all the different you know, internal copies and things like that that are going on between the different systems and across the network. And again, if you start thinking about, and we're going to talk more about this in the next section, when we start talking about disaggregation, these are network transactions as well. Every one of these north and south is a network. Every one of the east and west is a network. Here's an example of what it might look like if you offloaded. First of all, with offloading, you can get rid of the translation layers, which I think is a key uh, important piece. You don't need file systems and blocks. Uh, since my client is talking key value, it's talking about objects, uh, then I can just shuttle it down to the device itself as an object, and there doesn't need to be any translation on the host at all. And, and because the key value database uh, is running next to the media itself, uh, I, get a better, I can get better efficiencies between the key value database and the underlying media technology. I can tailor them particularly for that particular media. Okay, so I, I got some history lessons here, and I don't think most of you guys don't really even care about that. Um, you know, but just suffice it to say that disaggregation has been with us since I started uh, my computer science career back in the 80s, right? I, we were doing NFS way back when. And the, the, uh, 
the obvious reasons for that were you know, to have that consolidated in, to get rid of some of the physical limitations of a server per, plus disk, is to prevent me from having data copies everywhere. Um, you know, there's limited pathways. You know, only a server can only have so many disks directly attached to it before you're either running out of bandwidth or you're running out of hardware. Um, you know, and availability. You know, I can make the disks available, but I can't make them available with regard to the server unless I pair up another server and move things around. But by disaggregating, I can focus everything into a single location and I focus my management, I focus my availability problems into one place, and I have access to it from anywhere. So if my clients die or fail or do whatever, it's all right, I just put another box in and I can, I can still get at my storage. So that was some of the motivations for why we went to NAS. Um, scale out were the same thing, they were disaggregated as well. Uh, the idea was, again, I have thousands and thousands of client applications running in the cloud, uh, I don't want to tie them to a physical box. That, that would be uh, a mistake because that means that my storage either has to be ephemeral, meaning I only use it for that session and then I throw it away. Uh, but if I have needs for persistent data, I have to separate it away from the host so that my client application can move from cloud server to cloud server. So that's why scale out systems were created, were to essentially meet the demands of those thousands and thousands of client applications um, and it'll give me an underlying technology that allows me to continue to scale out capacity and access uh, over time by adding more and more nodes. But I still end up with this fan in, fan out architecture where I have uh, servers talking through some sort of a head uh, to the media. So I fan in to the, the guy that's managing the media and then back out to the actual media itself. Scale out's no different. So if I have a Ceph environment where I've got a server with 30 drives attached to it, all of my countless thousands of clients are all fanning into that OSD, and then he basically fans it out to the drives. So that's a limitation, because, and it's a bad limitation because it forces you to make hardwired decisions at implementation time. You have to figure out what quality of service you want to provide. I'm, okay, I'm going to provide uh, HDD level quality of service, but uh, for cost services, I'm, uh, cost reasons, I'm going to trap some of that hard drive throughput behind a server to l reduce the cost. Meaning, instead of having 10 drives or 15 drives where I can definitely access all of that uh, throughput through my 10 gig E-Link, I'm going to put 20, 30, 60 drives behind it with the idea that it's okay that I'm trapping some of that throughput behind that NAS server, but it, my cost point is lower, right? So we, we make these decisions, and no matter what happens in the evolution of our cloud, like those assumptions don't hold true after I make my purchase decision, I can't change it. I'm stuck. My hardware is fixed in the, in the way that I've chosen to architect it together. So that's a, it's a hard limitation that, uh, that offloading and disaggregation go to fixing meaning that I should have a finer grained unit of allocation that allows me to determine how I organize my system. So here's how uh, scale out disaggregates. Uh, uh, and I just talked about some of the problems. Basically there's a single uh, software component that manages the individual media and I stack up these pairs on a single host through a single or multiple ethernet connection. So each OSD is like its own little scale out device, right? Uh, that can either run on this system or wherever the storage is directly attached. And it's the direct attach that means that I have to run on this server. If the, if the drive wasn't directly attached, I could run it anywhere. Kinetic was another disaggregation mechanism. This was a way that the industry was starting to move in this disaggregation process. Um, it was a key value, as a, uh, key value uh, API. Uh, used TCP IP as the uh, fabric between the two. Had the basic get puts and delete. So back to that picture of a key value store, you could have implemented uh, a RocksDB inside of a Kinetic device uh, and provided that key value disaggregation and got rid of the file system and volumes that were in there. The problems were that it was a uh, unique protocol. It was brand new. Nobody had seen it, nobody had heard of it, and uh, required applications to be writ rewritten for it. 
And I know this because I implemented one of these devices. Uh, we implemented a key value device at Toshiba, and the biggest headwind that we faced was around how do I use it, right? And that's a great thing, but now what software uses it? And at that time, nobody did. Uh, and when people rewrote their applications to use it, because we had a handful of uh, development pro programs in place, they developed it to just modify the existing functionality and leverage the uh, pieces and parts of Kinetic that were there to match what they were already doing. So if you, for, for example, if you look at Ceph, and we go back to um, this picture somewhere, there, that picture, uh, it's managing a local disk, and so it just modified it to do puts and gets instead of uh, reads and writes, right? But it has east and west traffic there too, because it's talking from one OSD to the next to do replication and other things. Uh, Kinetic had peer-to-peer -peer, uh, operations inside of it, where I could have let the drive deal with the copies and the replication and the data movement. But nobody took advantage of those. And the, the real power of Kinetic was that, was that it provided a rich tool set that if you rethought and reimagined your application, you could get more out of it by utilizing and offloading not only north and south, but east and west as well. But unfortunately, uh, there was no multi-vendor because Toshiba dropped the product and uh, uh, the software you know, failed to create any colonies out there. So although it's still being worked on, it's uh, less of an issue today. The big one today is NVMe disaggregation. We're seeing this uh, you know, as part of my last job at Huawei. I worked with uh, NVMe and the Fabrics teams and uh, uh, we're now separating, disaggregating uh, across different types of fabrics, right? We have uh, InfiniBand and Fiber Channel and RDMA, iWarp, all these different strategies for disaggregating. But in addition to that, what's going to come out uh, by the end of the year, at least the first drafts are uh, almost done, um, looking for ratification hopefully in the next six months, uh, is TCP. And that's being driven by Facebook right now. Um, it's still block mechanism, which means that it's not really uh, conducive for uh, 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 scale out type of environments. You still need somebody to manage. Whenever you have a block, that means you have an address that you have to manage, right? I have to know where my data is and I have to manage that device. And it gets very difficult to scale out block at the block level. That, the big advantage to scale out is that we use key values and keys can be consistently hashed. I can use an algorithm to determine what system it's on. I don't have to go talk to somebody to figure out, oh, it's on this system and this is the translation to that. To that. I can actually just say, this key, I know exactly where it lives and go talk to him. And then that, that person is responsible for returning back the value. So it's in the right direction because it's disaggregating and TCP could be a game changer because it could provide for a day when we see generic TCP ports on our devices, which is a fundamental piece for uh, offloaded autonomous devices is to have a network port. One of the things that you can do if you had these disaggregated devices, I have Kinetic written down there, but you could substitute NVMe right now with that. Um, this is an older slide. Uh, is that once you do dis separate them out, then the OSDs, those little pieces of software that manage the disk, they can run anywhere. So I can now hyperconverge this world by just scheduling my OSDs inside my uh, app application cloud. And they can move whenever there's a failure of an application server, they can move with it to another place, another location. So they can be uh, scheduled and, and move around without causing uh, failure problems. All right. So what is this suggesting? We moved from aggregated to uh, SAN to scale out. If we truly disaggregate and we truly put intelligence in the devices, uh, we can get to basically a crossbar instead of a fan in, fan out. If I have the ability to uh, essentially take devices and have them participate as intelligent devices that are doing all the data management, taking client requests north and south, but then dealing with it internally, uh, I can create an environment where every client can connect to whatever drive they need to talk to and whatever drive can talk to whatever drive it needs to talk to for availability, uh, rebalancing, and stuff like that. And so that's what eSocial is. eSocial is trying to move in this direction.
Now, I caution you that this, this is like an end goal. This is strategic, long range. This is not something that tomorrow is going to happen, right? This is something that we have to plot a path of where are the big pain points, how do we get those pain points, and start walking in that direction. And that's what we're doing at UC right now, is we're trying to plot that path. We're trying to see where in the industry are pain points that we can address, and we can, we can actually empirically show that this is a direction you want to take right now, and we walk in that direction. Next one will be another step and another step, but eventually getting to this and in-store compute is the, the final goal. So. To provide for an overall storage system, they need, they need to have data availability. They need to have all the things that we see in modern scale-out systems today, right? They, they need to have availability. Uh, they need to scale capacity. They need to scale access, which means you know, every time I add another device, I'm getting more throughput. Um, they also need to define, and this is something I don't see in the existing scale-out products today. They need to define lines and classes of service. So think of a class of service as, uh, a big bucket about the features and characteristics of a storage system. So an HDD has a particular performance line of service, right? It's got high uh, latency, but it's got um, certain throughput numbers. Um, and that's a line of service, that, those performance characteristics. I then pair it up with data availability. I can replicate these three times and get you know, three points of replication. Um, these are all things that I can build up into a class of service that is my cold storage class of service or my warm storage class of service, right? Um, an entire system needs to be aware of these classes of services and then provide configurable mechanisms to allow users to use them. In other words, when I write an object, where should it go? Well, this is uh, the new... Um, uh, new hit movie and I need to make sure it's on super fast so it's going to go into the class of service that is my uh, persistent memory class. But over time nobody's going to look at it anymore, it needs, to be, it needs to go somewhere else. And all of that data management as it winds its way through these media needs to be definable and then have the devices be able to move that, device, move that storage around as needed. So use social storage, it must have north and south access uh, and it, to allow clients to do actual I.O. And it must have east and west uh, scaling out to provide redundancy, the quality of service, and uh, life cycle management. Uh, since we're just absolutely talking about adding computational resources into these devices, uh, at some point, you can conceive of them doing more than just the data management. And th there is a direct need for that when you start looking at edge and edge computing that is going on, where, where our data collection may be outside of our main compute facilities, having the ability to scale back the amount of data we have to send back for further processing is a huge win. So you can think of you know, cameras attached to storage devices that uh, maybe need to do filtering of you know, the, the faces and only sending faces back, or actually locating individual faces before sending back alerts and other things of that nature. Um, there's a myriad of examples of where, when you get out to the edge, having the ability to do general compute is an, an important feature, especially in the world of genomics and other things like that. There's lots of places where I can show you this. And we, we have an example uh, at the symposium. We're going to be looking at a database that's doing this, that's distributing the queries out to all of the devices as well. So what is eSocial? First of all, don't think hardware. Uh, this is a software abstraction. Think of this more along the lines of the next evolution of cylinder block, I mean the cylinder track uh, block mapping to LBA to key value to the next thing. It is strictly uh, an API abstraction and that allows hardware builders and architects to build the hardware that matches um, their particular media. And so when I think of autonomous devices with an SSD, it might be an SSD with an Ethernet device on it, but it also might be, when I'm talking about hard drives, it might be three or four hard drives together behind a controller that make it look like a single key value store, right? It all depends on the cost and price point of what you're trying to achieve as an architect. So uSocial is not trying to make those decisions for you at all. It's trying to say, here is the rich set of characteristics that your device can do, right? So it's a standard object protocol that disaggregates 
uh, mechanism-based. Policy is all configured. Cluster operations, and the cluster operations are for distributing out the configuration because we need to know about who our neighbors are. It is not for creating cluster operations for clients to leverage. So there's no, this, no transactional system that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about strictly uh, managing which devices are participating and updating it as failures occur or as devices are, are created. Peer-to-peer um, -peer operations that allow for copies and data movement. Uh, data integrity me mechanisms, being able to you know, essentially check some of your data, make sure it's all uh, good and is not rotting away over time. Um, it's an abstraction that provides for improved failure domains. My failure domains become smaller. I, I don't have a server mount, uh, with 20 drives attached to it that if the server fails, I lose 20 drives. It becomes whatever that unit is that is the autonomous storage device itself. Um, and ultimately would uh, support in-store compute. So no, no restrictions on media type, form factor, capacity, components, or fabric type. That's a decision left up to the hardware architects. So what does it look like? It looks a lot like scale out systems, right? So if I was to look at a Ceph box and take those server, that picture of the server with a bunch of OSDs and strip away the server, it kind of looks like that, right? Each device is its own object store manager and it participates with all of the other ones to provide a unified global object store. Um, so that means that we have these monitors that monitor the configuration and changes that occur in the configuration, uh, updating all of the participants as, the, as that configuration changes. Um, but we also add the new thing, which is the cast. The cast is the unit of scale out. Scale out occurs within a cast. So I can have a scale out of SSDs, a scale out of hard drives, a scale out of SMR drives. I can have different quality of service um, that have their own scale out capabilities, right? And what that allows me to do is that now I have a essentially uniform quality of service that I can manage objects through that. And I can do that through just having defined configuration that everybody shares. Again, it's an object API, and just like Ceph, you, you need things like virtual block because applications still write blocks. There's still applications that use file systems. There's file systems available as well. So what does that, what does some of the information lifecycle management look like? So, if you look, that, that's the configuration. The cluster map is the configuration that we're sharing, and we make sure that it's consistent between all the members, and it defines who my neighbors are, but it also can define a class of service. For example, here's a uh, content delivery network. Uh, we've got essentially five different casts here, and for a content delivery network, we're going to use three of them. And when I put a key value, I tag it with where do, what, what is the strategy I want for this object. This object is a CDN, so it looks in the cluster map and sees that the first element in the CDN and the CDN graph is uh, CAS3. And so it, that's where it writes the data to. And then over time, there are triggers that are definable that tell you when, when it's time to move, whether it's age-based or access-based or things of that nature. Um, then it gets essentially moved by the device itself without the client's uh, knowledge. or act, It just migrates it, just like in scale out, we rebalance without telling the client where, where this is because ultimately it's the consistent hashing that tells it where the object actually lives. So the same, the same mechanism for rebalancing and recovery can be used for doing lifecycle management. What about in-store compute? So, I would not suggest that every device, use social device, is an in-store compute device. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But because of the price point, I might want devices that are uh, more expensive, that do more things for me, and that would be part of my quality, my quality of service that I would define. My class of service here would be a high-end in-store compute device, and it would live in its own cast. And I could scale out that day, that, uh, those kind of devices together with each other. And when it comes time to do a function, I essentially just, again, using the consistent hashing function, 
it essentially will mask out to all of the members of the, uh, uh, that have that particular object or that object range uh, a function and parameters. So, for example, in um, uh, the project that's ongoing called Skyhook DB in, at UC, they create and they objectify, objectize the uh, tables in a database, in a Postgres database, um, and they're, they're sharding on rows. And each object has its own set of rows. And so uh, I can then take a query that is saying, shoot, you know, select you know, all the rows that have in this table that have less than you know, some factor, some column less than five or something like that. I can then figure out those objects that that, that table is contained in, because it's going to be contained in a set of objects, and then push that essentially that select down to all of the devices in parallel and have them select on the portions of that table that they each have. So that's one of the, the powers of this in-store compute model is that I can essentially associate a certain amount of compute and algorithms to a given object and have that run against that object at any time. Okay, so one of the things I'm very cognizant of, because I come from industry, I come from a company that like built these devices, is that there needs to be room uh, for open source and proprietary. Uh, if you're gonna get investment from the big uh, media players, there has to be a way that everything can't be open source. So the devices, what you're seeing there in purple is kind of where the space of, you know, where companies could provide new products, uh, new devices that speak, use social, they don't have to be open. As a matter of fact, there's all sorts of ways to get competitive advantage by essentially doing smart algorithmic uh, matches between key value and object stores to the underlying media. Um, there's lots of cool things that can be done in that space when, you, when you're right next to the media and doing things locally. But there should also be an open source version of it. So if I wanted to create this with a, you know, a Raspberry Pi and a device, I sh there should be an open source project that allows me to do that. And that's what we're doing at UC Santa Cruz, is we're doing that uh, open source project. We're just starting on it. Uh, it's a long way away. So what are we doing at UC? That, that's kind of view social storage. Um, what are we doing at UC Santa Cruz? Um, we have, uh, I actually have two grad students now. Woohoo! Uh, I have minions. So. Um, uh, the first thing, like I said, is that this is a strategic view. This is a five-year view type of thing. Um, the, the first thing is how do we get the industry to believe that offloading is the right direction to go in? We're already looking at it. We're, we're seeing movements in that direction. Samsung has a key value device. There's other, other people that are looking at disaggregation and key value as well. Um, but no, every time we bring this up in public forums, the first thing we get hit with is like, why? You know, show me, show me why, the, not just these slides, which are nice, pretty language, but what is the actual empirical evidence that says this is the right direction to go in? So that is actually the first project that we're engaging in right now, is the offload evaluation. We're trying to construct an empirical model that allows us to compare very disparate systems. Like if I wanted to show the value of a Raspberry Pi with a hard drive attached to it versus a big Intel Xeon with 30 hard drives attached to it, how do I compare these two environments? What is the metric I use? Um, it gets very difficult to show apple to apple comparisons. And so that's what we're trying to do with that first project. And I'll give you a kind of an overview of what we're doing. And you guys, I'd love for you to beat me up and tell me I'm like wacky and what's wrong with my, our strategy. I only think I have about five minutes left. Um, and then finally, the full API definition. This is talking about a key value store. What are the APIs for that first key value store? What should they look like? There's already work going on in the um, object twig uh, at SNEA. I encourage everybody to participate in that as well. There's work going on in NVMe with key value. A bunch of people are looking at this. Um, we want to do it. Uh, we want to follow what all that work is and not re reinvent the wheel, but we also want to look at it with these broader goals in mind. In other words, what, all, what are the other things we're going to need down the road and make sure that those things are moving in that same direction. Okay. And then the in-store compute is the other piece. Um, so the presentation that we're going to be giving uh, at the symposium is going to talk about 
everything from canned functionality, and I conceive of a, a key value store as canned functionality, right? This is, I'm offloading C, uh, compute that runs on the host onto the device. So that's step one of in-store compute, is having a key value store. But there could be compression, encryption, a bunch of other things that are canned, canned sort of uh, uh, functionality. To uh, the far end of the spectrum, which is general purpose compute, where I'm actually allowing people to write whatever they want to write. And we see examples of that in the industry today. And we're going to have uh, a representative from NGD Systems give a presentation on a container-based approach, where I actually deliver a container to my storage device and let it do whatever it needs to do. Um, and then there's middle ground uh, in an interpreted language, where I'm limiting maybe some of the functionality, but I'm minimizing some of the management overhead from both the industry, managing tool chains and debug environments and all sorts of other stuff that need to be going on, uh, to uh, just the uh, interpreted language itself. So that's in-store compute. All right, with the last uh, four minutes or so that I have, I'll talk about this offload evaluation. So this is, the, this is the fundamental problem, right? This is what I described in my presentation, that we have data management software, we have media management firmware that runs on the device. The client I.O. Uh, is uh, provided by the client, but underneath of it all, between the actual media and the server, is client I.O. plus data management I.O., right? How do I actually tell you that the right is better than the left? What is the number I provide you to say, from a cost perspective, from a space perspective, from a watts perspective, that this is actually a better approach. So what we need to do is we need to define a unit of work. Is what, this is my conclusion anyway. We need to find a unit of work that can be equally done in either environment. It should be independent of the environment that it's performed on. In other words, it should be able to be equally run on one is versus the other. And equally is an interesting word. It just means that the entire task can be completed, um, uh, com completed basically. Some environments would be capable of doing multiple units. For example, if I had 30 drives attached to a four-way Xeon with a ton of memory, I should be able to do many of these work units. But a Raspberry Pi may not be able to do but a fraction of a, of a work unit. But that's OK, because the cost profiles, the, uh, the power profiles, and the space profiles are vastly different between those two environments. And so when I start looking at it from a dollar per work unit, kilowatt per hour work unit, this is where I get my apples to apples comparison, right? Is because I can now look at these work units as compared to cost management kilowatts, all right? The problem is, what is this work unit? What does it look like? First of all, we need to simplify this. You can get really complicated really quick. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start with this research by just looking at north and south. We're not going to worry about the other network traffic. Everything that happens with the network traffic is just more wins for de de uh, uh, disaggregation. Um, um, and we're going to be looking initially at local traffics and not disaggregated. Um, and we're going to avoid trying to get lost in the details of cycles and particular platform architectures and things of that nature. So how do we do that? We introduced the notion of a MIBIWU, uh, which is essentially a uh, media-based work unit. And it's some load over time. It's workload dependent. But we define it in terms of only the media being the bottleneck. In other words, how much work can we get out of a particular piece of media? So there will be a different MIBIWU for a hard drive, for a Seagate hard drive, for a Western Digital hard drive, for a Samsung SSD. There will be different MIBIWUs for those that allow you to do these comparisons. But that is the thing that remains consistent between these environments. If I want to compare an Intel box using uh, uh, a SSD from uh, uh, Toshiba against a Raspberry Pi using that same SSD, that becomes the uniform, uniform piece of the puzzle. So if I make the work unit in terms of that uh, media, then it, then it is directly comparable. So what, what our plan is right now is to take some key value store. Uh, we're using RocksDB, and we're using a known benchmark of YCSB. We're taking a consistent uh, SSD. And we're going to measure what the unrestricted throughput of that, key, uh, of that YCSB benchmark is 
to, the, uh, to that particular media. And we want to see that they're not being hitting any memory bottlenecks, any CPU bottlenecks, any other bottlenecks other than the media device itself. So theoretically, the, uh, the throughput underneath this, this throughput here should match what this device is able to do by itself, right? The maximum it's able to do is the maximum I see out of the bottom of this, right? And once I know that I have that, that becomes my unit of work. Let's say it's 10,000 transactions per second. That becomes my unit of work. I can now figure out how many of these devices can I add onto a server before I start seeing that curve go from a linear progression, yep, to a flat progression. And then I know how many MiviWoos that server's able to do on that. On the other side, it's whatever fraction of that 10,000 transactions per second it can actually do. Anyway, so that's the work we're doing at UC uh, Santa Cruz. If you have any questions or anything, come find me. I'd love to talk to you about it and see if you, there's any interest in what we're doing and maybe help participating. So thank you.